outside Sevastopol, January 1854. Each day begins and ends with artillery, with Allied ships firing on the fortresses protecting Sevastopol. Ashore, more guns entrenched in earthworks pound the rigid forts protecting the city, the most feared of which, known as the Malikov, has a stone tower giving its battery of guns a panoramic view. From there, the Russian guns answer. This is a war of artillery and mud, of sharpshooters and trench raids, one where bodies lie unburied in no man's land. But the real killers are not the cannons or the rifles. It's the disease, the lack of food, the poor tents that let the rain in, the lack of resupply that sees troops still wearing summer coats in winter, wearing blankets as their uniforms rot off their bodies. There's no wood or charcoal for fires. Men sleep in huddles so they don't freeze overnight. Forget the Russians. The Allies have a new term for their greatest enemies. General January and General February. Would you like to see a full episode dedicated to the military machinations that caused the charge of the Light Brigade once you finish this one? Well, with Nebula first, you can see it right now a full week early, but more on that later. By January of 1855, the British public was up in arms. They'd read reports of troops dying of exposure outside Sevastopol, of rations that rotted on the docks of Balaclava, partially due to bureaucratic red tape and partially because the roads were bad and there were no horses. While the French had issued their troops sheepskin coats, British soldiers, by contrast, froze to death. Then, this process of public opinion turning against the war accelerated during the siege of Sevastopol, because the nature of the war at this point meant that there were fewer bigger battles to report on, and journalists instead turned toward reporting on army scandals. British leaders were so worried about these press reports, especially the reports written by William Russell, who Lord Raglan claimed was a traitor aiding the Russians, they decided to combat the printed word with the power of the image. They dispatched the photographer Roger Fenton to take patriotic photos of the conflict. Traveling in a special coach that served as his wheeled darkroom, Fenton photographed subjects that included famous battlefields, prominent personalities, and a haunting still life, the Valley of Death, showing a collection of cannonballs lying along a sunken road. He also engaged in outright propaganda, photographing soldiers in warm jackets and hats that the army did not actually manage to issue until spring. Yet the spin was too late. People had enough. In late January, 1,500 Londoners protested the war by barraging pedestrians, buses, upper-class coachgoers, and police with snowballs. Public criticism led to the Conservative Party losing a vote of no confidence and being swept out of government, replaced by the highly anti-Russian Lord Palmerston. And then an unbelievable thing started to happen. Civilians became so sick of hearing about military failures that, in perhaps the most Victorian move imaginable, they decided to just step in themselves and fix the problems. Newspapers collected money to buy the army food and medicine, and women across Britain knit balaclava hats for the soldiers. Meanwhile, a group of railway engineers solved the commissariat's logistics problem by building the Grand Crimean Central Railway, a rail line that could ferry supplies from the port of Balaclava up the 600-foot plateau to the siege works around Sevastopol. Similarly, telegraph companies laid lines all the way to Crimea, so by 1855, generals could communicate directly with political leaders and war news arrived in Paris and London within hours. Responding to the lack of medical care, London Hospital Administrator Florence Nightingale, who I'm sure will get her own episode of our show in the future, trained and deployed nurses to treat men evacuated to Constantinople. But she wasn't the only one. Mary Seacole, who you can see our series about here, did much of the same closer to the lines. In fact, the Russians had a similar nursing program, run by Nikolai Pirogov, a medical professor with links to the royal family. An innovator, Pirogov changed battlefield medicine forever. He invented a triage system that ensured doctors worked on men that could be saved, insisted that all operations be carried out under anesthetic, pioneered less dramatic amputations, and instituted the use of plaster casts. Yet while Russia's supply and medical situation was bleak, the war didn't have the same impact on their public's opinion at home, or in France for that matter. See, both were essentially dictatorships at this point that censored their press, with secret police forces that hauled citizens in for speaking negatively about the war, even in private. State newspapers claimed that Russian defeats were tactical withdrawals. Really, the public's one view of combat in Sevastopol came from a trio of short stories written by artillery officer Leo Tolstoy, published after the siege's conclusion. In them, Tolstoy took the reader on a tour around the besieged city, describing gritty details like the necessity of stepping over rotting horses, the shriek of cannonballs, or the horrors of the amputation ward. 
These Sevastopol sketches established Tolstoy's literary reputation across Europe, and he would later return to several of the incidents when crafting his epic novel, War and Peace. Yet despite the propaganda and silencing of dissent, it was still clear to average Russians that the war wasn't going well. Rumors swept the country that the Tsar had declared that anyone serving in the army would be freed from serfdom, and as a result, serfs flooded the cities, forming mobs that demanded to be enlisted as soldiers. Ironically, these hyper-patriotic uprisings occasionally had to be put down by the very army they were trying to join. As the war dragged on, the Russian government increasingly began to worry about a general uprising. Not only had prices spiked due to the Allies' economic warfare and shutting off the Baltic trade, the war's drain on men and livestock, especially horses, damaged Russian agriculture. Rumors circulated that Russia was losing the war and that the Tsar had put them in a hopeless situation. So on March 2nd, 1855, when citizens first saw the black flag over the palace signaling the Tsar's death, it was popularly believed that Nicholas had killed himself. In a way, they were right. In the last weeks of his life, Nicholas had grown increasingly regretful about starting the war and despondent over Russia's inevitable defeat. Ailing from pneumonia brought on by the flu, to his inner circle, it appeared the Tsar simply stopped fighting the illness. Hopes of a quick post-mortem peace were dashed, however, when his son Alexander II continued the war. Though, really, things were slowly winding down. With winter over, Sardinia having joined the Allies, Austria threatening to do likewise, and an Allied fleet once again threatening St. Petersburg, there was simply no hope for Russian victory. The final blow came on September 8th, when a mass Allied attack smashed into the ridgetop forts. It was bloody and close. The first waves were repelled, but on the second wave, a Zouave planted the French flag on the ruined tower of the Malakov. By February 1856, diplomats were hammering out a treaty to end hostilities, the terms of which were surprisingly favorable to Russia. They would return all territory taken, as well as returning a piece of territory to Moldavia. Moldavia and Wallachia were made functionally independent under the Ottoman banner, and the Ottoman Empire joined the concert of Europe. As for the Black Sea, it was demilitarized. Neither the Ottomans nor Russia could keep naval forces or establish military posts there, a provision that only held for a few decades. But while it didn't change much on the map, the war served as a wake-up call for the major powers. The Russians took it as a cue that to survive, they had to modernize. Witnessing the effectiveness of British and French armies of freemen, Tsar Alexander II went on to reform the state and abolish serfdom. And deciding Russia was not well-placed to defend Pacific territory, he sold Alaska to the United States. The Ottoman Empire, under financial pressure from its allies, granted more or less full equality to religious minorities and launched into technological reforms of its own. Though, oddly enough, the British push for reform failed. Conservative aristocrats cast any criticism of the military as unpatriotic. And soon, the 1857 uprising in India shifted public debate away from Crimea. Yet perhaps the war's greatest legacy is how it taught the world how to conduct a modern war. Trenches, rail lines, rifles, and sea mines. Those were the future for those that would see it, because military observers from across the globe witnessed the action firsthand, including American officer George B. McClellan, who would go on to try, and fail, to create his own version of the Siege of Sevastopol during the American Civil War. Actually, as an odd aside, regard for French units was so high in the U.S. that both sides of the Civil War would form Zouave regiments, essentially going into battle cosplaying as French soldiers. Humans are weird. So, ironically, a war that started over the custody of holy sites, a concern that seemed almost medieval, would end up showing us what modern military conflict looked like, from military rail lines to war correspondents filing their stories via telegraph, to modern military hospitals and trench warfare. The Crimean War truly foreshadowed the wars of the future, even those, sadly, still raging today. Of course, there's always more history to talk about. In fact, right now, over on Nebula, we just released our blow-by-blow -blow deconstruction of exactly how the Charge of the Light Brigade happened a full week earlier than it's going to be available on YouTube. In it, we dissect how the most famous poem in Inspired actually doesn't tell you the whole story. A vague order made due to military inexperience, miscommunicated, exacerbated by battlefield terrain, and filtered through a tangled mess of overweening aristocratic privilege and personal feuds, that is what put in motion what came next. Russian guns roar, not only from ahead, but from left and right, sending men and horses tumbling. The Light Brigade speeds up from a trot to a canter, 
Then more batteries join the barrage. The horsemen break into a full gallop against all odds and all reason. And we're not the only folks releasing stuff way early over there. Because with the help of a bunch of our creator friends, we came up with an awesome feature called Nebula First, where you get access to a ton of great content from creators like Jacob Geller, Becky Stern, Legal Eagle, and just tons more, all of whom post their videos earlier than you'd ever see them on YouTube. And of course, we release all of our Extra History series episodes at least a full week early and ad-free with Nebula First. But that's really just the beginning, because Nebula is also home to a ton of exclusive original content that you just can't find anywhere else. I've made some myself, Jeff and I both made Nebula classes in our areas of expertise, and more originals from a ton of your favorite creators are getting released all the time. Heck, even one of my absolute favorite video essayists, Lindsay Ellis, is now releasing all of her content exclusively on Nebula. I watch them the instant they drop, they are great, I cannot wait for more. Now, if you sign up for Nebula using our link below, you actually get our discounted price, which works out to around $2.50 a month for an annual plan, which not only is like 40% off the regular price, but it's also less than a cup of coffee in any reasonable establishment. And using that link really does help support myself and the rest of the EC crew continue to make the content that you love watching and that we love making. And I know I've said it before and I hope it doesn't come off as pedantic, but thank you so much for that. It's a huge help. And yeah, I really hope to see you over there on Nebula real soon because I truly believe you're really going to love watching it. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 